It's a joy to be here this morning with you all and to worship our Lord, our God, praise him in song, and it's also an honor and a privilege today that I get to introduce our speaker. Before I do that, I want to read a passage from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, it says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, and with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside the myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. I wanted to start with that verse this morning of a way of introduction because as I'm going to introduce to you the speaker whom I haven't seen in 40 years, my cousin, Tom Keener. We were on Facebook and I, uh, we had invited him to come to my mother's 90th birthday party yesterday. And in passing, I simply, on instant message, I went and I said, well, since you're coming up here, we'll probably get you to preach. And he came back with the response, I would be glad to. I thought that was amazing for someone who was going to make a long trip and say, yeah, I'd love to preach the gospel to you. And so I, re I read that verse to you and hopes that you understand that the ministry that he is to fulfill, that he has done for the last 40 years, has taken him a lot of different places. Tom Keener has been a minister in the Church of Christ in Mark, Texas, since November of 2007. He's also served in churches in Rosebud, Texas, Ryan, Oklahoma, Bedford, Virginia, and, and Collinsville, Collinsville, Virginia. He received a Bachelor of Science in Education degree from Oklahoma Christian University and a Master's of Divinity degree from the Harding School of Theology. He is also the president and a member of the board at Camp Crossfire, which I think is probably a a, a camp for kids, isn't it? Yeah. Tom and his wife, Debbie, have three children, two son-in-laws, one daughter-in-law, three grandsons, and two granddaughters. Tom's hobbies include entering award-winning baking goods and fair competitions, and this is crazy, but he loves to ride roller coasters. <laughs> now, the reason I hadn't seen him for 40 years is because he's been fulfilling his ministry. And I love him for that. And today he's going to talk to us about the subject growing up in the church. Tom? Well, I've gone a lot of places and Harrison just doesn't seem to be on the way to any of them. But I'm glad to be in Harrison. My wife Debbie is with me. We're glad to be here. I believe this is my first time to ever be a surprise guest speaker. So when you're coming the day after the surprise birthday party, you don't get announced. But uh, I am here. Uh, just out of curiosity, if you are a keener by uh, marriage or by birth or whatever, would you raise your hand? Okay. All right. It's not often that I'm in a place with a bunch of keeners. But it's good to be here. Harrison, Arkansas has always had a special place in my heart and memories. That is because for as long as I can remember, it was the home of Uncle Elbert, Aunt Retha, and their children. When I was a toddler, my family lived in Green Forest where my dad preached. During my youth, there were many visits to the Harrison Keeners. Now growing up, I had mixed emotions about seeing Uncle Elbert. He always wanted to look in my teeth. In my younger years, that sometimes led to time in one of his dental chairs. Over the years, we spent many nights at Aunt Retha's home. With six in my family and seven in hers, I'm not sure how she found beds for all of us. I remember on one visit, we all loaded up and went to a place in Harrison called Jerry's. Now, I don't remember the name of that. Lynn helped me with that. And this was the first time in my life 
that I ever had, what we call in Texas a corn or corny dog, but it was called there a dippy dog. And I think everybody got a dippy dog, and some of us liked them so much we got a second one. I remember that event. The last time I was in this building, or the one over there, we're not sure about that, was for Cousin Karen's wedding, so that's been a long time ago. Now, some of my experiences with the Harrison Keeners involved church. I remember being here one time for a visit, and the gospel meeting was going on. And before the service began, the visiting preacher had gathered the young people down at the front, and he asked us some Bible questions. I remember that. As I mentioned, my dad preached at Green Forest, and some years later he was asked back to hold a gospel meeting in Green Forest. And Albert and Retha and the kids came over for some of those services. And at one of those services, I was sitting next to my cousins, probably Larry, but I definitely remember I was sitting close to Louie. And it came time for the closing song. Now, they had a wonderful song leader in Green Forest at that time. And he believed in leading every verse of the song, and I liked that. But when it came time for the closing song, the preacher said, the, uh, the song leader will lead us in a couple of verses of a closing song. Well, traditionally, song leaders would lead the first and the last verse. But this particular song leader led the first and the second verse. As the second verse began, Louis, being orthodox and scriptural, sang the last verse of the song. He said it should be the last verse. You know, you could say that my cousins and I grew up in church. Have you ever been asked, were you raised in the church? Perhaps you've said, oh, well, I was raised in the church, or, or on the other hand, I wasn't raised in the church. Those statements refer to our religious background. We especially use them to question or affirm if one was raised in churches of Christ. I'm thankful that I grew up in the church. I was the son of a preacher. My dad, Joe, preached here a number of times. Many of my earliest memories involved church. I've attended Bible classes and worship longer than I can remember. There were numerous gospel meetings, vacation Bible schools, and youth activities. Sometimes I was taken on visits to members' homes. I have pleasant memories of visiting preachers being in our home and of relationships with elders and other members. Our family's life centered around the church. I guess you could even say I was raised in the church building. I watched my younger siblings while mom taught ladies Bible class. On countless other occasions, we kids were at the building while dad was in the office. I grew up in church. From an early age, I was taught that there was only one church. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul says there is one body. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, Paul says, And God placed all things under his feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. Paul says there is one body. Christ has one body. That body's the church, and so there's one church. In the fifth or sixth grade, I was in Bible class and got to lead the prayer. And in that particular prayer, I said, thank you for our churches. Brother A.E. DeVore, who went home to be with the Lord just this last year in his 90s, corrected me. It's not our church. It is not our churches. It's the Lord's church. I've never forgotten that correction. Now, from an early age, I was taught that the church belonged to Christ. Romans chapter 16, verse 16 was one of those verses I learned early. The churches of Christ salute you. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, where Paul is talking to the elders from Ephesus, he tells them to be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. We read it a moment ago from Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19, where Christ is presented as supreme over all. He is the head of his church. Now, from an early age, I was taught that the church was the saved. As a small child, I learned, here's the church, here's the steeple, 
open the doors and see all the people. You learned that too, didn't you? But even then, I knew that wasn't quite right. In senior English in high school, the teacher commented one day that saying church building was redundant. You know, after all, the church is the building, right? No. Well, I pointed out to her, and hopefully, respectfully, that the New Testament word for church referred to the people and not a building. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47, we read, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The King James Version says, The Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. The Greek word for church means an assembly, a congregation. God has a community of faith, the church. Some outside of our fellowship have complimented us on having a strong doctrine of the church. That understanding for me began before I can remember. I grew up in the church by growing up in scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul says to Timothy, And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. From my childhood, I was read Bible stories. There was memory work, especially during the time that my grandmother spent with us after my mother died. There was becoming a daily Bible reader in fourth grade in Mrs. Rogers' class. I learned the scriptures early. And Paul says the scriptures are important. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In my youth, I became acquainted with phrases that emphasize the authority of scripture in guiding the church. Speak where the Bible speaks, and be silent where the Bible is silent. Call Bible things by Bible names, and do Bible things in Bible ways. The early leaders of the Restoration Movement believed that all believers could be united if they would follow Scripture alone. As I grew older, I learned about a fancy new phrase, sola scriptura. Well, that just means Scripture only. Are we going to follow scripture only as we seek to follow God and be his people? A professor introduced me to the phrase of being a back to the Bible people. And I really like that phrase. I want to be a part of a back to the Bible people. And somewhere I heard about being people of the book. More than once I have preached that if we are to be a back to the Bible people, we must be people of the book. Someone told me as we were walking over from the fellowship hall to here that now we expect our preachers uh, to start with 10 minutes of jokes. I said, you are aware that your sermons are on the internet. And I have uh, surveyed some of those sermons. And you are blessed to have Stephen, one who preaches the word to you. That is not the case in all congregations, not even in churches of Christ. Christ's church must follow God's word. As I grew up in church by growing up in scripture, I grew in my understanding of the importance of Jesus. Some make the mistake of rejecting the church and saying they just want to follow Jesus. Lenny Bruce said, a lot of people are leaving the church and going back to God. I think Lenny's a comedian and meant that to be funny. It's not really funny. And we can understand the frustration of those whose churches have rejected the leadership of Jesus and the authority of God's word. At the same time, one must remember that Jesus said he would build his church. He is the head of that church. Vance Havner observed, We are hearing today about those who like Christ but do not like the church. But Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. How can we like the head but not the body, the groom but not the bride? We don't become closer to Jesus by neglecting his church. 
at the same time, we must not make the mistake of emphasizing the church to the neglect of Jesus. We must not leave Jesus out of the church. As mentioned in that wonderful introduction Larry read that I wrote for him, as mentioned in that introduction, I have won a few blue and red ribbons in fair competitions on baking bread. But you may be a championship baker, but you can blow it. One afternoon, I was mixing up a batch of dough, and I put in the flour and the water and the oil and, and so forth, and the phone rang. And I went and answered the phone, had a brief conversation. I returned, and I finished mixing up the dough. One hour later, it was supposed to have risen. It had not. And I went ahead, and well, I made whatever I was going to make, and it didn't rise. And it finally occurred to me that I had gotten everything together before the phone rang except adding the yeast. That made a great deal of difference. One ingredient, a very important ingredient, was left out. What happens if we leave Jesus out of his church? Much the same result as bread that doesn't rise. One church had a sign in front of its building that read, Jesus only. A windstorm blew away the first three letters and left us only. Without Jesus, the church becomes us only. The term church of Christ means that we are a people who belong to Christ. Jesus saves. The church is the saved. As we noticed in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus is the head of the body and is supreme over the church. If a church ignores the leadership of Christ, what will it be the church of? Without Jesus, the church is just another group of people. To be Christ's church, we must follow his teachings. As Christians, we are little Christ. Everett Ferguson, in his excellent book, The Church of Christ, A Biblical Ecclesiology for Today, made a simple but profound statement. God gave a person, then a proclamation, and then a people. This is the historical and theological order. The person is Jesus. The proclamation centered in Jesus. The Bible is the written form of that proclamation. The proclaimed word calls together a people. Those people are the church. The church showed me in scripture who Jesus is. But long ago, Jesus and the preaching of Jesus produced the church. For over 62 years, I've been growing up in church. Yes, I am older than Larry. But the more I grow in Jesus by following his word, the better I can help the church be what God wants it to be. Uncle Albert and Aunt Retha were married for 61 years. Elbert died November 2nd, 2006, at the age of 87. Jesus and his church have been an important part of their lives, of their marriage, of their family. Anytime I have a kinfolk that makes it to age 90, I try to attend their party, surprise or not. <laughs> there haven't been very many of those, by the way. But in the fall of 2006, Debbie and I made another trip from Texas to Arkansas. While we enjoyed a stop in Harrison and visits with Retha and a couple of the cousins, the main reason for the trip was the 90th birthday of another aunt, Elbert's sister, Edna. Edna lived outside of Russellville, not too many miles from where she, Elbert, my dad, and two more brothers grew up. Growing up, they attended church at Bell's Chapel, a little country congregation. On the Sunday of Edna's birthday, I was honored to preach at Bell's Chapel, and I preached this basic sermon. In a small foyer of that building at Bell's Chapel are some pictures. And when I was there, I looked at those pictures with the help of some kinfolks, I, they pointed out some people in the pictures. But Grandpa Keener was in 
those, one of those pictures. Grandpa Keener was a leader, an elder in the Bells Chapel Church. And my cousin Catherine told me just recently that also in one of those pictures was a young Albert and a young Retha. Perhaps it was the dedication of the church building back in the early 50s. Grandpa was a church leader. Uncle Albert was an elder here. Now Larry serves as one of your shepherds. We've been growing up in church for years. And I urge you to grow up in church by growing in scripture and in following Jesus. We're going to sing a song of invitation. If you're not a Christian, if you believe in Jesus, we urge you to repent of your sins, to make known your faith in Jesus, and to come and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you're a Christian, you have special needs. We want to help you with those. If we can help you in any way, won't you come as we stand and sing?